In this video, we will look into the Wajir story using a social network lens. We will look beyond the personal narratives to uncover what were the network weaving steps taken that eventually led to the creation of an organization that was responsible for stopping violence and preventing the onset and escalation of conflict in Kenya's Wajir district. We start by recognizing that the problems that originated the eruption of violent conflict in Wajir around 1992 were a product of a web of interrelated factors over which the average citizen has little or no control. A pastoralist society suffering from scarcity of resources, clan clashes, loss of livestock, influx of refugees from neighboring regions, among others. Like a hippo that hides most of his body below the waterline, invisible to us, these interactions between all these factors was difficult to spot. What comes out to the surface of reality are very real events, such as conflicts in the market area that were preventing women to buy and sell their products. And these actions were what triggered the initial core group into action. One of the first key lessons from this story is that the people who have more to lose or to win, that suffer the real-life consequences of the complex problem, are the ones who have the better chance of making a difference in this particular issue. And this was the case of the several women who sat down one day and started talking among each other about what they could do to stop the clashes in the market. Let's call these four women the core group. With their focus on the very visible part of the problem, they initiated a process of recruiting other women from their personal network to monitor the activities in the market and to make sure conflicts did not erupt. The initial core group of four people managed to spread a viral idea to a group of further ten women who established themselves as trusted mediators of conflicts within the market area, holding and sharing the space. This initiative was so successful that they immediately thought about expanding it to other areas. The clashes in the market were a mere reflection of a broader problem that involved other stakeholders. One way to do this was for each woman to go back to their clans and personally engage the elders. This reveals the concept of exploring the weak ties that a core group has. Every member of the core group had her own connections to other social network clusters. By exploring and engaging these connections, the second big expansion of this peacekeeping network took place. We all relate to a number of different people. Some of them are very close to us, like our family, our parents, our trusted longtime friends. Some we know little about, maybe a co-worker, a friend of a friend someone we just met at an event. We tend to surround ourselves and spend a lot of time with the people we are very close to. With them, we have strong ties. They are our source of comfort, enjoyment, and stability. But it is the weak ties, the people we know little about, that have the highest potential of opening up opportunities of collaboration we have never heard about. So if you're looking to grow your network beyond your inner circle, you should explore and spend some time getting to know your weak ties. The elders of the many different clans clashing in Wajir were key nodes to recruit into the peacekeeping network. Given their leadership position and centrality in the network, the women knew that they were key agents in the process of propagation of the peace virus. In the early stages of a network initiative, we are only as strong as the first followers. You are never a leader until someone decides to follow your lead. The elders could play this most important role in the Wajir case if the women were able to bring them on board. As conversations between the women and the elders evolved, there was a natural lack of faith and trust from the elders. But there was one exception, an outlier. This particular very old man became the first follower of the movement originated by the women. He managed to play the key role of bridging the ideas of the women into a language that could be understood by his fellow men. Are you in control of your clan? 
we are being given an opportunity to give something back to our clan, to bring peace back to our families. So this was not about the women anymore. This was about they fulfilling their leadership roles and being accountable for it. And it worked. And so, with full transparency and with the involvement of the district commissioner, the Elders for Peace group was formed that sought to investigate and mediate conflicts in the region. Again, the key to the success of this initiative was the availability to do risky activities, such as going after criminals and burglars of cattle, and seeking a peaceful ending to these incidents, and becoming personally invested in seeing these conflicts come to an end. The two groups, of women and of elders, now mobilize the individual support of many people that they've gained over the months to organize festivals, to celebrate achievements, recognize peers, and do fundraising activities from within the community. Business people pitch in because peace is good for business. And this support, trust, and faith from the communities is called social capital. A type of resource that can be used just like financial capital. Soon thereafter, the third big cluster of the peace work is brought in. The youth. The idle youth was a big source of recruitment for militia and fighting groups. The first group of young people to be inoculated with the peace virus was small but soon grew to the point of successfully bridging this idea to the households and their families. The Peace Building Network now consisted of the women, the elders, and the youth, the future leaders of communities. Although very well connected, to the point of even having women walking among the 66 elders, the network felt it was time to tackle the systemic issues that created the conflict in the first place the root causes of issues that repeat again and again. This required more structure than just the informal network of networks, and a very long-term commitment to education, employment, monitoring, and quick surgical interventions. The peace-building network now has social capital of trust within the community and links to almost every person in the region. It spans across different social landscapes – women, elders, youth, families, business people, members of the government, militia, police, etc. This network is indeed well positioned to take responsibility to start tackling the systemic problems that originated the conflict in the first place. Despite its social recognition and power, the network needs some formal structure in order to be accountable for what will be a very long-term commitment. So, in May 1995, the Wajir Peace and Development Organization was formed in an effort to legitimize the peace effort and weave together all stakeholders for keeping the peace. The challenge for this organization was how to maintain the original characteristics of nimbleness, agility, and trust-based relationships and reconcile that with the Kenyan and Somali legal requirement for an NGO. Working now with members of parliament, local government officials, NGO, and other stakeholders, the organization was setting the roots for becoming a new civil institution that is responsible for maintaining the peace in the district. Education and training programs were developed, and even the Muslim and Christian religious leaders were involved in them. Multi-stakeholder response units were deployed every time there were early signs of conflict erupting, so as to stop these from escalating into something which is harder to control. New monitoring systems were put in place, where, with the participation of the civil society, the telltale signs of pre-conflict could be detected and communicated to these teams. Analysis tools and methods from other peace-building initiatives in the world were studied, incorporated, translated, and adapted to the local context of Wajir. The new organization supports 
but does not replace the informal network of peacebuilding that was weaved during the previous three years. For it is this network of committed individuals and their trust relationships that keeps the new system in place. So, to summarize. Number 1. Start with the tip of the iceberg. When faced with a complex social problem, while it is important to understand the root causes of the events we're watching, it can sometimes be frustrating to try to find the best place to start tackling them. Start in the place where you, personally, and your core group has skin in the game. In this case, it was the market activities. Number 2. Don't think about scale. Start with a very small team and branch outwards, creating and growing trust with key individuals in the wider periphery of the core. It is very important that you don't get distracted by thoughts of scale while you are focused on nurturing the initial core group and its activities. The success of this core group, the culture you develop during these early days, will do the rest of the work for you. Number 3. Close triangles We often confuse networking with network weaving. Create the conditions for people to meet each other and create new ties and relationships while working on concrete local problems. You might know a very large amount of people, but ultimately you only need a handful of committed individuals that take risks and believe in their mission because it affects them directly. This is done not by merely exchanging contact details, but by promoting physical meetings and introductions. If you do this often enough, the network effect will take hold and the idea or message will spread organically to places you don't even know existed. Number 4. Stay nimble. Don't formalize your group into organization until it is absolutely necessary. Remember, the formal organization hosts the network and provides legal and infrastructure support. The work is always done by the network.